in the name of Jesus. Amen. Today we are celebrating the festival of the Ascension. Matthew, Luke, and John all record the importance of this momentous occasion. The ministry of Jesus showed us his compassion. The death of Jesus showed us his selfless love. The resurrection of Jesus showed us his vindication. And his ascension reveals the totality of his kingdom. He secured his lordship of heaven and earth when he was taken back into heaven and a cloud took him from the sight of his apostles. Three years of ministry, one holy week, and 40 days of adjusting to the resurrected life. The disciples had been with Jesus for the majority of it, but now they would have to adjust to life without him. In the book of Acts, we hear that the men stood gawking into heaven, and then two men in white robes, reminiscent of the messengers at the empty tomb, stood next to them and said, Why do you stand here looking into heaven? Oftentimes, when we hear this question, we assume that the men are trying to motivate the disciples to get on with it. Start doing something. If Jesus has gone into heaven, who's going to save the world? In our day and age, church membership is in decline. Involvement in a local congregation seems optional. And personal opinion dominates sound doctrine in matters of religious belief. Last weekend at the Augustana District Convention, we wondered what to do about the pending clergy shortage, which could leave parish pulpits empty. All this, I'd hope, could be good enough to raise an eyebrow and light a fire under the chairs or pews of local Christians. What will be our impact? What will you, as an individual member of Holy Cross, do to save the world? Believe it or not, at the turn of the first and second century, these same concerns began to traumatize the early church. Young pastors were being discouraged and St. Paul wrote a letter to get them back on track. They say history repeats itself, and so Paul's word for them may be a word for us today. Last week, you may remember that Paul had brought Timothy along with his second missionary journey. The good news of Christ had captured the hearts of those who were members of the Ephesian church, but they needed a faithful pastor to stick it out with them and Timothy was the candidate. After a few years, false teachers started to lead his parishioners astray. They had neglected the important work of prayer. The local church leadership was plagued with questionable character, and it appears that Timothy was getting a little discouraged. When things had gotten out of hand, and it seemed as if Jesus was being taken away and covered up, Paul pointed them back to the basics of the faith. He suggested some training, nothing but a good old confirmation class and a review of the basics. Everything created by God is good, he wrote, for it is made holy by the word and prayer. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of faith and of the good doctrine. Train yourself for godliness, holding to the promise of the present life and also for the life of the world to come. Paul is not suggesting that our personal piety could add to our salvation. Before our reading for today, he announces, we confess the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed to the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. In other words, godliness is not something that we do, but it's actually a person. Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, suffered, died, and buried, raised on the third day, and ascended into glory. It is finished, Jesus said, and so your salvation is complete. There is nothing left for you to do to earn his grace or gain any standing before Almighty God. 
Jesus is the only source and hope we have in matters of eternal salvation. He is the only one who can save the world. But now that you have been saved eternally, what are you going to do in the meantime? As we await the return of Jesus Christ, how will you continue in true faith in what is unseen but certain? If you know that Jesus' death and resurrection was for you, where are you going to turn now that Jesus is hidden behind the clouds? Paul suggests exercise. Oh, come on! And he's not suggesting a casual walk or leisurely recreation. He points you to the places where Jesus can be found in this life. Paul isn't interested in acts of service that only have a positive impact in the world, but never deliver from the fires of hell. He suggests CrossFit training in scripture, doctrine, and the promises of Jesus. It's time for a 30-day shred of your priorities, values, and character. I have to admit that I really like the idea of being physically fit, but I also have to admit that I really like cupcakes more than lettuce salads. And I'd rather read a book than go on a run, which would probably take the same amount of time anyway. I have several apps on my smartphone that track my eating habits and my physical exertion, or lack thereof. I am even really good at tracking all of that stuff. But the results always seem to be the same. As you know, a veneer of aspiration will not change the lazy pile of soft tissue that I have become. I blow right past the calorie target like a badge of honor. And if I had one of those Fitbit watches, it would yell at me all too often. The same is true in matters of faithful fitness. If I skip out on my morning devotion, I feel a little bit unsettled the rest of the day. If I don't turn to the Lord in prayer, I spend hours worthlessly worrying. If I would decide that I'm too tired to attend church, then I would divorce myself from the Christian community that embodies my gracious Savior, not to mention I probably wouldn't have a call in ministry much longer. If I prioritize everything but the words of faith and sound doctrine, then I can't be upset when God seems distant and silent in the midst of all of my life. Before you can share the lasting promises of God with others, you need to vigorously toil and strive to keep the promises of God firmly fixed in your ear and heart, for the devil is all too quickly trying to steal them away. So Paul says, practice these things. Immerse yourself in them. Keep watch. Persist in these things and you will save yourself and your hearers. The, two, the New Testament witness is in agreement. On the last day, Christ will come again, and you will stand before the judgment seat of God, and each one of you, not only pastors, will have to give an account. It is not likely that God will care much about your GPA or how many times you earned employee of the year. Your bank account, pension, and stock market value won't be overly helpful at this point. Certainly, he may have some concerns about how you parented or were neighborly, but most likely you won't be able to remember if the good outweighed the bad. It is doubtful that he'll care how many devotions you completed or how many prayers you had memorized or fervently prayed. He won't care how many times you have or have not read through the Bible. Remember, he's the author of it, so he already knows it anyway. Instead, he'll probably ask you this. Do you know me? Do you know me, the living God, your Savior, the hope of all those who believe? And struck with awe and wonder before the unimaginable sight, 
your gaze will be fixed on him who Moses could only view from behind. No doubt you'll probably stutter and stammer a bit. Although you had no problem misusing the name of the Lord, now you can't even muster a prayer. But then out of the corner of your eye, you see a nail-pierced hand reach out and grab the forearm of the Father. With a grin and a twinkle in his eye, which becomes a tear running down the Savior's face, he will say, this one is mine. And then he will lead you through the halls of heaven, where he has gone to prepare a place for you. No doubt such joy and wholeness begins today as you learn that the Savior's promises are for you and that you can take Jesus at his word. He was born of a virgin for you. He suffered, died, and was buried for you. He was raised on the third day for you. And he will come again and take you to be with him forever in the glory and splendor of everlasting life. Thanks be to God. Amen.